everyone. Uh, this is our new uh, The Chat Chamber podcast episode and today is Friday, wonderful Friday. Uh, very sunny in the fact. The 13th, by the way. Ah, oh, yeah, the 13th. Actually, when the... <laughs> yeah, Black yeah. Friday, when the crisis... Christ is dead. It's a crisis. It was the Black yeah. Friday, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Well, it was not 13th though. It was just Friday. <laughs> and then because of the crisis, it became Black yeah. Friday. But I mean... The date was not there. Okay, so fun fact indeed. Um, it is wonderful to welcome Sergei Kimo. He is visiting lecturer at RGSL for some time, and I would say a businessman. Would you call yourself like that? I, it is a bit of an old-fashioned word. Yeah, you can call me that way. <laughs> you okay. can call me that way. Absolutely. Great. Um, welcome. How yeah, are you today? Delighted to be here. Honored to be here. I'm very happy to support RGSL in its um, endeavor uh, in these in these series. I am wonderful because, as you've mentioned, it is Friday. Um, I've just had my full day packed with team meetings, and uh, they're over. Everyone is happy, and uh, I ended up here. Looking so, forward. so mostly also the work is with people. Even if it's about finances, you know. <laughs> the work is mostly with people always. Like people is the biggest asset that you have anywhere. Like anywhere, anywhere. Any company that you look at is it's it's made by people and made of people and then you cannot really how uh, how can, for that. how can one attract like uh, even the the right people? Because I think you need, you know, to have this kind of a very, very nuanced attitude to what qualities for an specific uh, startup for example uh, you need or is it a universal type of a person well that depends right i mean if if we're talking which startups are we talking scaling or uh, or like startup startups okay so we see that it really depends also on like the time like the time scale yeah sort of look i mean um and that depends on whether we're talking about founders or or the actual sort of first employees but so in the very early stage, what you have is you have people that are essentially very often misfits for the traditional industries or people that have spent time in traditional industries and then decided to sort of switch off and try something on their own. Yeah. And, uh, and there the mindset is you don't have a traditional split in, in competencies, right? So you have people that are, yes, they're good at something. I mean, chances are that if you were doing, let's say, you know, a finance startup, then you would have finance background, right? But, but then in terms of your roles, it's essentially a human orchestra, right? So you're doing everything. And when you have multiple founders, you are splitting the responsibilities, but then you're doing everything anyway. And then the very first employees are the very same. So the very first employees that join a startup most, most likely join because they are actually into the idea and into the pitch rather than they are into whatever salary, yoga classes, uh, what have you in the, in the software world right now. So, it, that, so that's, the, that's the profile, right? So in, in the very early stages, it's, everything is about like-minded individuals and then once the, the company grows, then of course there is a skew towards people that simply like you as a workplace, which is absolutely fine, right? And then of course you still have uh, with, with these growth companies, you still have a very strong ideological component anyway, which means that, you know, if you go work for KPMG, well, I mean, there is no ideological component really. I mean, it's modern day slavery, that's what it is, which, which is one in a way, but, but not the one you would be, you would be appealed by. A but a structured uh, type of uh, work. Yes, I mean, sort of. So, so, and then the startups, they would al always have the ideology under the hood, right? So startups would always have sort of this mission, vision, um, that sort of thing that, that they use to attract uh, attract people. Also attract customers, by the way, not only, not only employees. I called you a businessman for a reason, okay? Right. Yeah, it's an old-fashioned term, in fact, but um, I can call you also, I don't know, a founder, a co-founder, a creator, enthusiast, whatever, but you have had quite of experience comparing to your age regarding companies and founding them and right. participating in the process. So what is your story? How it started and why? Uh, well, well, it's a long one, right? Um, yeah. 
So you might have Googled me or might have not Googled me yeah, anyway. Googled so I'm not, I'm not I'm not actually from Riga, right? So I, I, I didn't grow up in Riga. I, I never ended up in Riga on a, on a systemic matter uh, until I actually was 17 years old. So I graduated high school, 12 grades in Latvia um, when I was 17. And I moved to Riga from Ludza, which is this town down at the border of Russia pretty much, right? So the Latgala area. So uh, I graduated school, came over. Um, by the end of 12th grade, I already had a place secured. So I, I, I passed the, the, the tests for Riga Stradinch University. I wanted to do international relations. So I spent three years BA in uh, RSU, International Relations. Um, that was something close to a nightmare uh, in terms of the workload. I mean, that was pretty bad. The way I understand it now, I mean, what, what Stradinch was, was there, you know, there were, the, the, the program was very inclined towards academia. So you got to write a lot, right? So, so you basically spent, I remember, so I was living in Yurmala actually, um, same city that I live now, although in a different place. Um, I lived in Yurmala and I lived far away, so I lived, like if you are familiar with Yurmala, so you, you have the Tintory part, which is like the, where the concert hall was, and then you have the, the rest of Yurmala, so I lived in the rest of Yurmala. So I remember myself uh, essentially coming over from uh, Stradinch on the latest uh, bus. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I came over, I, uh, you know, I typed in these, uh, they, they were called Kopsavilkomis summaries uh, that, that people write in RSU. Um, and I essentially I took a shower and then I grabbed the first bus, I never slept even. Um, I, I grabbed the first bus back to Stradage. <laughs> that, that was, that was the, the schedule some of the days, not always, but some of the days. Mm -hmm. So that was my BA. Then after I grabbed uh, a, a SORUS scholarship, I went over to Central European University in Budapest. So I spent two years in Budapest. It was a come and go to Riga, of course, I mean, but technically I lived for two years there. So that was my first MA. Um, I worked all throughout already, so I did uh, a bunch of uh, translation works. Um, I did Russian, Latvian, English and German translation back and forth. Um, what else? Yeah, so then I, then I came over here and uh, I was sort of in the, so I mean, do you reckon I was what, 22 years old? Um, and I was in between Sort of trying to find out like what what do I actually like because I, I got terribly disappointed in the in the in the governmental career um, already in my BA years right so I spent half a year with the, with a lot of, with Saima uh, as an intern and that was uh, tremendously bad what, tremendously bad what in the uh, type of work uh, you didn't like and what you understood stood there yeah everything everything <laughs> everything I didn't like everything uh, I mean <laughs> everything starting from the pace ending up with the uh, you know the added value that you actually bring yeah. and, uh, and the motivation of people to stay there I'm not talking about deputies now right so I'm not talking about when you're elected right so when you're elected I, I might assume that you might have sort of a separate set of motivations yeah. and, and things that drive you which I'm not prepared to discuss today uh, <laughs> because I am extremely politically correct um, so <laughs> But uh, when, when it comes when it comes down to employment in the in the governmental sector, I think it is very hard to find sort of you know these driving factors yeah. for yourself. So what propels you forward, and um, that is something I didn't see, and uh, and and hence I didn't see any appeal. Right, so but there was it, no appeal. So it came already after the. Uh, no, during the BA. So okay. during the BA, that was my Saima, so like six six months in 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 in, in the parliament. Mm -hmm. Uh, which started off as an internship and, and I never continued to actually proceed to work in there because that, that was it. And um, yeah, so, so that was my first MA in, in Budapest and then I, uh, I came over here. Um, I started my first company back in the days, uh, which was Vortex Oil Engineering. So that was the first oil and gas startup um, out of Latvia. I think the last oil and gas startup out of <laughs> Latvia as well, um, which, was a, which was a bit of a dull move back in the days, but it played out reasonably okay. I wouldn't say it is a, like an ultimate success story, but it played out reasonably okay. And at the same time, I, I enrolled into RGSL um, for my second MA. Uh, and, and that was curiosity driven thing. I mean, I was just curious about sort of one finance. I thought, okay, I mean, I, I might just expand the scope a little bit. So because my first MA, um, it was technically political science, but then it was political science with the inclination into quantum methods, right? So statistics pretty much. And, uh, and political economy. So I thought, well, one finance might enrich the whole thing. 
and uh, this is where this is how I ended up in RJSL to begin with. And then on the startup part, so Vortex was the first one that essentially has taught me in a very hard way um, how to build a startup, uh, deep tech startup, which is even more cumbersome sort of than the the software startup. Um, and uh, yeah. I essentially, you know, traveled all the way from being pre-seed, trying to, trying to uh, pursue a people that a 22-year-old guy can actually do something in the oil and gas industry, which was kind of a hard pitch to 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 convene, to be honest. Um, and uh, and then my second company came came about, right? And that was Cotom, and that was the first biotech company, um, and, and my first immersion into biotech to begin with. So. So that was the company when we figured out how to uh, create so-called uh, drug delivery coatings um, on uh, medical implants, right? So on uh, dental implants and orthopedic mm -hmm. implants in our case. So all the knee and hip replacements that, that, that people uh, receive in the, in the old age or because of the trauma. So, so that one, again, biotech is a completely different field. Um, so that one sort of, again, propelled me all the way through, you know, getting pre-seed for the basic idea and then into the preclinical trials, then into clinical fundraising, into clinical trials. So, the, the, you know, I, I pretty much got the whole package yeah. very fast. Um, so the whole immersion. Well, then after this one, uh, these continued to live, right? So Coltum and Vortex, they continued to live. And uh, after this one, I spent, what, three years or so uh, with uh, therapeutic companies that I have. I don't like the word consulting. I never use it. I've helped helped them out uh, in when when it came to packaging their intellectual property, and um, packaging their well clinical validation strategies. Essentially, trying to figure out well what is the best way to go into the clinical research after preclinics are done, and how to fundraise for clinical research. So essentially, worked with the early stage drug companies um, that were doing it. Afterwards. Um, me and, and, and the other partner of mine, uh, Gary, so we have co-founded the company, which is called One Genesis. So One Genesis is now, again, it's still alive, sort of and kicking. Uh, One Genesis is now the biggest um, digital health company or digital health startup, whatever you want to call it, in, in the Baltics. Right? And, and that one accelerates clinical research. And it's a data company, right? So it's a, it's a software tool slash data company. And, and One Genesis tools essentially help uh, pharma companies, or they're called study sponsors normally, to find patients or study subjects faster for clinical trials and uh, engage them faster and onboard them in clinical trials faster. Um, to give you a hint here, like why the whole thing is needed, well, um, if you look at the traditional sort of drug to market cycle from lab to actually hitting the shelves in the pharmacy, uh, the pill essentially takes 10 years to arrive, right? And um, like two years, two and a half years are spent finding subjects for clinical trials. So one genesis cuts it in, you know, up to, you know, up down to three months or four months instead of two years or two and a half years. Um, yeah, and then the last, the last thing, the last two things. Um, so after one genesis, uh, we sort of sat down and said, hey, um, we get a lot of, we get a lot of um, requests coming in to help fundraise or to invest ourselves um, from, from the other startups in the therapeutic field and non-therapeutic field. And, uh, and this is where we said, well, we do have huge network and pharma already. I mean, we pretty much know the best people and we, we happen to know the best people in the longevity part of biotech specifically. So age related diseases. Um, and, and we said, well, you know, we need an investment vehicle of ours. And uh, this is where we have co-founded uh, Laundry C, which is a, an investment capital, a, a venture capital fund, right? So an investment firm. That is headquartered in the EU. Um, it's not out of Latvia, but it's a, an EU member state regulated. Uh, yeah, so that is a 35 million euro investment fund that specifically invests in early stage drug and non drug companies in longevity. And the last one is um, Longevity Science Foundation, and that is the latest addition to our portfolio, and that is the nonprofit that we have co founded recently. Mm. The purpose, it's, it's Swiss-based, based out of Zug, out of Switzerland. Uh, the premise there is very simple. When we started the fund, uh, we basically realized that there is a whole bunch of longevity research, early stage, super promising longevity research that can be cutting edge, that can solve you know myriads of problems that we have now that never gets to the market because it's never funded. 
And the reason for that is uh, the, the way how sort of the very early stage science can, can get funding is not VC because VCs need sort of the, you know, the investment horizon. They need to understand like where is the market, where is the exit, et cetera. So they can only opt for non, non equity uh, grants, right? So essentially, you know, grant funding. And, and, and it's very screwed. Right, so 90% of grant funding is shoveled into Harvard, John Hopkins, whatever. So all these small research bodies, like they don't get, get anything. Yeah, and so we, we've created the foundation essentially to support these, these early, stage, uh, early stage guys. But then we, we created it with a twist, right? So we sort of embraced this whole Web 3.0 um, concept where the foundation actually has its own DAO, where the donors, uh, where the, the participants or the, the, of the foundation are essentially being enrolled um, and, when, and, and are granted voting rights. So that the donors of the foundation essentially get a direct say of where the foundation essentially invests and, and who, who, who it supports, what type of research it supports, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's it. Like in a very, very, very brief manner. Would you say that your BA environment, student university, may have had some inspiration on your fields? I don't know. This is, the, this is the funny part. No, seriously, I don't know. Um, what had an inspiration in, in, in the way I have worked uh, throughout my whole life is, uh, uh, I think, high school years. That one had an inspiration. It had a bad one, because if you, if you trace back to my high school years, um, what, what, what I had was a fairly, fairly hostile environment, which uh, sort of made me, you know, spend as much time in the library with the books and, you know, essentially studying um, things that you would normally not study in high school anyway. Uh, and that has formed sort of my circle of interests, right? Um, so that, that yes, Strutinch, maybe, um, but then Strutinch uh, gave a lot in terms of, you know, being meticulous with the research, I guess. Right, because it was essentially a lot of a lot of academic work, and academic work involves you know working with a bunch of sources and, and being able to combine these sources together in a meaningful way. So that's that. And then, of course, you know, um, Budapest absolutely gave the international exposure, right? Because well, you get into the environment where you have professors from all over the world, and, and that was a source. Essentially, that's the, the the school that was founded and funded by source. So the guy essentially brought in all the top faculty. And it's been Budapest because Soros is Hungarian, right? Uh, that, that's the only reason. I mean, it's, it's now not in Budapest anymore because of Orban. Yeah. So it, it moved to yeah. Vienna. But anyway, if any of you, you know, consider, you know, second master or first master, um, I highly recommend it, right? So like the top place to be. And, and, and that one gave exposure, right? So that, that one gave sort of the understanding that there is, there is this whole world out there and, you know, a bunch of people that everyone has their own way of looking at it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's always a compilation of factors. But what is, what is your driving force? Because there has to be something underneath your skin that told you, okay, I really want to do this. And it was, was it pure enthusiasm about something, deep interest, ambition, or a higher meaning? higher sense that you want to find solutions to improve society or people's lives. Or is it sometimes also practically just profit-based, right? Because that's also one way how to look at it. Profit-based is secondary. Uh, profit-based is primary when it comes down to, you know, the fund, for example, because the fund essentially manages other people, other people's money, right? So um, you need to be profit-oriented anyway. Doesn't mean you cannot be mission oriented at the same time, right? So you can pick your investments in the way that they would yield a return, but then actually change the world for good. Generally, profit is secondary, if not tertiary. Um, it's uh, my so I, I sort of believe that everyone should should have their value add. Okay, so we're we're living. Look, we're living in a specialized society, and what I mean by that is quite simply, and and you'll see where I'm getting with this is, um, you know, if there is a fire, you call a fire department, you don't call a doctor. Vice versa, you know, if you, if you broke your leg, then, then you call a doctor. And, and we know, and this is how our society essentially functions, right? So we have these people that are responsible for, for, for things and they're responsible to do these things in a proper manner because otherwise the whole thing would collapse. So same here, 
Right. I was, you know, I was not, I was not born maybe intellectually gifted enough to, to, you know, to become a scientist, you know, to come up with whatever a, a cure for cancer. But then I approached this thing from the from the other end, right? So, so I sort of tried to, and I, I'm not, I'm not saying that I actually succeeded in that one, uh, right? But uh, I tried to, try to grab, you know, this my value add, some sort of value add that I saw as as might be useful at some point. Um, through through what I did, that's it. That that's the that's the driving force. Um, because otherwise, you know, why 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 are you here anyway? Right. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not saying like everyone should should should, should want to change the world. That is stupid, absolutely. Um, but but then you should realize that you know if if whatever you're doing, you like, on the one hand, and then on the other hand you see that it actually brings some benefit into you know the overall pot jar in which we're all in then you're you're on the right track i guess because i always have thought that if you found a company there has to be a deeper value underneath why are you doing this because i mean it will consume totally your time as much as possible because when you are creating something yourself um, it's like a child basically that you're oh, yeah. ready to invest 24 7 because you know because if you don't it will mess up in in some way uh, indeed yes the child metaphor is the one uh, is is a fairly working one and each and every time it, it is essentially the same although uh, you should also understand that in order to build something so my, my biggest like the biggest fails that I got uh, generally speaking, um, all had, and they were in, in different spheres and, and, and for the different reason, but um, they all had one common denominator. And that common denominator was me not being able to delegate uh, things to other people and trust other people enough that they do they would do as, as good as I would do, or at least good enough, okay, right? So, so what I mean by that is, um, yes, it's all, you know, mission driven and you should, whatever, you should be 100% devoted and you should care about it as a child, what, what have you, but, you know, you should also uh, be able to trust other people. And as the team grows, you should trust them in the very same way that, that you would trust yourself. And then the, the, the basic thing here is, and, and I mean it, right? So, um, so like all of my employees or or partners or whatever mm -hmm. are essentially much smarter than i am in the things that they do like much much smarter than i am i think that is the beauty of being uh, you know in this field that you can sometimes just be the 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 glue you know in a sense you can be the glue and and then it's not even about the glue it's about sort of understanding that you know you need to surround yourself with people that that are much better in, in, in what they do versus if you would try to do this yourself right um, and, and that's that's pretty much it oh this reminds me of that that I mean I will tell you who you are when you show me your friends because basically if you if your friends are smarter than you um, and they somehow give you um earth or like a ground to work from right it makes you a better smarter person because if you surround yourself uh, with people who are less less smarter than you i mean Inevitably. at that point you will not grow because i mean you will be the smartest one in the room as i mean in yeah. that specific room uh, I, would, uh, I would agree but going back to the metaphor of a baby when is it right. time when is it uh, time to kill your babies right because i think that is a problem for for many uh, oh yeah absolutely it's it's, it's called founders bias yeah right? it's called founders bias and, and the other the other way of, of of calling it is wishful thinking right which is you know believing that something is true when it's not even close to being true um pink glasses whatever you want to call it uh, well there is no there is no one way of answering that. I, I have how been, you do that. Maybe. I have been very bad at, at this historically. How can I, you kill I, a baby? I have, I, mean, I, have I have been very bad at this, um, and um, so there are so many things that I would have done differently now, like with with the experience you have now, you know. Um, but uh, I I think it's 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 when you have exhausted sort of um, objective ways of of making it work, 
right? So because, you know, I mean, every every other company when you start it, for example, um, is is as good as, as the underlying hypothesis is, right? And then and then you are normally you're operating with a bunch of these hypotheses, and then they have sub hypotheses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you might want to you know optimize your resource. You want to want to bootstrap the whole thing to the point where you can say that you know I've tested most of it and it doesn't work, right? Um, that being said, sometimes companies actually find value into something and in something different than you know the more the most sort of obvious things of how we measure value and that is you know revenues etc right so sometimes companies do not generate a dime but then are still valuable so that really depends right but um, it, it's just sort of being honest with yourself and, and, and looking at it and seeing well you know it's it's sort of uh, it's a reverse hockey stick right so <laughs> just free falls yeah. <laughs> so when it's free falls uh, baby or not but you know you need to move on yeah, but at the same time, but how can you draw boundaries when it comes to your free time? Because basically every person needs to rest, right? And and if it's a baby that you are ready to invest 24-7, what but is the babies time? Babies cry a lot. What is the time when you take a day off? I mean, never, I guess. I, 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 don't, I don't think there is a, such a thing that a day off. And the day off, I mean, look, there are two types of days off. Day, day off, uh, corporate corporate worker, corporate employee type of day off. And this is where you close your laptop, 5 p.m. Friday, um, get in your car, whatever, get drunk. On Saturday, you go, you know, walk with your dog, play your PlayStation, um, to do whatever. And then, you know, Monday, you scream, fuck. And then 9, 9 a.m., laptop opens and off you go for another sort of five, five day sprint. In, in this case, it's, it's a bit of a different thing. So in my, in my situation, I'm not saying this is universal, my, my days off or my sort of time to rest um, is twofold. A, I switch what I do, right? So I, I just focus on the other thing. And that... that All that day is rest in a sense. It, it is, yeah, I mean, switching your, your focus is, 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 uh, is, is letting your brain to, to rest from the previous thing, right? And, and you, you normally feel when you're exhausted by the first one and you cannot add any value anymore. That not being said, I cannot procrastinate for three hours looking at like you know, a dot in the, in the laptop screen. I can, I'm very good at it. So, so uh, that's first one. Then the second one sort of, I have this tendency of, of you know, draining my whatever stress from the work week in uh, physical activity, right? Because I mean, from, from the, but that, that comes from the ch child years, right? So I used to play tennis a lot and I spent uh, pretty much all my free time when I was not studying on the tennis court. Uh, back in Wutsa, by the way, we had tennis courts and we still have them and there is a new one uh, that was built, which is a beauty, beautiful place to be. Yeah. Anyway, so, and, and then I, 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 I dropped tennis, um, but um, I switched to triathlon at some point. And, uh, and, and this is where, you know, I occupied myself, uh, not professional, even close, of course, but I occupied myself with physical activity. And then sometimes, you know, I, I have hobbies, you, you know, you're a human being. You have I, hobbies? I do have, a, I do have hobbies, I do have hobbies. But, uh, yeah. okay, outside sport, what, what hobbies do you like? Um, I like uh, car restorations. So, so I restore cars sometimes. What with kind a, of cars, with recently? A group, with a group of friends. Look, we do, we normally do sort of all the German classic. So all your, you know, old Mercedes's, yeah. all your Pagodas. Beatles, uh, maybe. Beetle, it's not a very desirable car to restore, but it's, <laughs> it's a fun, it's a fun car nevertheless. It's yeah. like, you know, sort of the, uh, the Porsche, the, the yeah. Porsche for the, for the crowd, right? <laughs> because it's, it's rear engine. But uh, so, so that sort of thing, when I, when I do have time, right? Um, I also have a PlayStation, by the way. <laughs> Going back. Five PlayStation, which isn't exclusive now, but okay. you cannot buy it anymore. Yeah. I mean, you can buy it, but I think like it's triple the price, but I never use it. Um, it's just there collecting dust. Yeah, so, so, so these things, these things normally. Uh, what my, my question, completely unrelated, but also going back to these concepts, uh, <laughs> halo effect. Another interesting, I think, uh, concept in this field. What, what do you mean by halo effect? In, in, uh, in the sense that there are specific people that sometimes can generate revenue 
for companies only by their presence, you know? Okay, but that's all over the place in the startup world, right? So, I mean, the, the, the reason of why you, um, why you get sort of KOL, KOLs, key opinion leaders, um, and sort of these high profile people on board in, in your companies is specifically because of that, because they can, you know, instead of you doing business development activity for, uh, for half a year, they can essentially collapse this whole half a year of yours into one phone call that they can make. Yeah. And, and that's it. Right. Um, that being said, I mean, you should grow to a certain point where you can actually attract these people because they need to offer them something. And that something is usually, you know, either share options or a hefty payroll or anything like that. But, but then again, I mean, when you, when you are capable of doing it, then uh, it makes it easier, much easier. And it's all over the place in the startup world, like advisory boards, non-executive directors, you name them. Like, okay. The higher the guy you can grab from the industry that you were in, the, the, the better. Well, ma many enterprises, yeah, specifically, like, attract people for their competence, not only, you know, for the popularity. And I think because they, again, of course, bring this added value. Yeah, well, so there is this, uh, there is this very interesting and, and at the same time very frightening thing, which is called human capital, right? And human capital is, is the, 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 everything that you have, pretty much, right? People are the ones that are generating your intellectual property anyway, tangible, intangible, whatever, right? Uh, it's all made by people. Right? The company doesn't exist as, as, a, as an entity, right? So as a cell, it's, it's, it's a compilation of people that are united, whatever, by brand name, by, you know, legal entity, what have you, but still people. So, um, well, startups actually a lot, like they fall into traps of, of, of being two people dependent where, you know, when you are a team of uh, five guys in the room, one leaves. that's okay. Yeah. That's still okay. okay. And, and one possesses, you know, one knowledge and the other one, the other knowledge. But then some sort of knowledge transfer should happen into the company where when you scale, you should be able to hire an engineer from another company and you should be able to sign an NDA with him or her and, uh, you know, give him access or her access to uh, to your proprietary files, whatever, and make this person your employee, right? So this this component of an individual being unable to replace should go at some point of time. From the founder's perspective, you essentially want yourself to be replaced. I mean, that's my again, that, that's that's my way of looking at it. You want yourself to be replaced at some point um, with a guy from the industry. That they essentially have worked, you know, for 20, 30 years, and sort of, you know, become a professional CEO in your own company, so that you can, you know, you you will still be a shareholder, but then this person would 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 you know accelerate growth, would sort of bring in know-how that you never knew, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's uh, th there should be you know th there should be a knowledge transfer always happening anyway from from people to the entity, and and into sort of this common pool. Uh, whatever you want to call it, like the knowledge wake that the company possesses or any other entity possesses, not exactly the company. Mm. When you were in the process of uh, founding your first company, right. um, how did you come up with the oil industry? The first name also. Through, through the accelerator. So um, I, I came over, I remember I came over to Riga and a friend of mine said, well, um, do you want to you know, go check out this event? Uh, which was uh, one of the deep tech accelerators here, here in Riga. And uh, I said, well, why not? I mean, you know, I was always interested in tech. It's not that I was a genius, uh, a genius inventor, right? I never was a, neither I am now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I knew a, a thing or two about, you know, how to sort of try build the case, right? In terms of the commercial, um, you know, commercial part of the company. So I thought, I said, well, let's go, right? And uh, and this is where the whole thing started, right? So there, I in this event, I met um, the guy who then became my CTO, chief technical officer, and uh, and he he had specific relation to oil and gas, and I said, well, why don't we try oil and gas? Um, and uh, yeah, and this is where the whole thing started. Yeah, but when you're in the process of founding, um, you. You have to, I mean, I think at least that you need a circle of people right. to, or to start from, or at least someone who knows someone. Oh yeah, so I was, I was, look, I mean, it, it is, it is, of course, 
um, not true to say or to think or to claim that I was, you know, the sort of solo guy that, 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 that decided, okay, you know, let's do an oil and gas company. It doesn't work that way. So we then went through an acceleration process with the whole team. The, the whole team grew. Another co-founder joined. Um, so that, that sort of thing, right? And, and then we iteratively, so we worked without any money for the first year. Right. I mean, as a company. Right. Uh, so there, there was no, no investment, nothing, because we were looking at the market. We were trying to grow the network of contacts in like around us. We were trying to validate sort of the product proposition that we had back in the days of the Vortex. Um, and only then we essentially transformed if you will, into what, what you would call a startup, like from the group of people that just work together. We try to formalize into whatever legal entity. And that legal entity then, you know, uh, went out there in the sort of open ocean and uh, tried to fundraise. So it is, you know, it is a very sort of step-by-step -step process uh, where uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And um, we just grew the network around us little by little, like person by person. But you were passionate about, about it. I was interested. I was interested. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I was interested. And um, I thought that, well, look, you need to start somewhere. Yeah, of course. Okay. And uh, uh, this is actually very interesting. So um, if you look at and if you, you know, Google up a bunch of studies about how our um, cognitive system works as human beings, uh, the reason why um, humans have this very, very big problem with daring to attempt something is eventually the fact that what we do is so we we sort of understand our status quo like where we are at this point of time right and we kind of understand so we we're very good at envisioning the the big goal where you're you know on a 300 meter yacht somewhere in the mediterranean um and you know i think sometimes the goal is the problem as well maybe right <laughs> but but the, the the thing here is that we're very good at understanding where we are, where we want to be, whatever your motivation is, right? Saving the world, being on the yacht, you cannot blame people for, for, for any of these. And then we, the, the last thing we're good at is understanding there is a very big difference between these two conditions, right? So like you are not this guy, <laughs> so we're on the boat. And then we don't understand how to get there, right? And um, That is the million dollar question, I think. It, it's not the million dollar question. It's the question of being... Of, of attempting to break this thing down into pieces and like this is the most cliche things that you can say that it actually it actually works okay so you need to start somewhere and and for me it was well you know i want i, I kind of understood by then that i wanted to work in tech and i wanted to work in tech from the founder side like i wanted to create something in tech or at least you know help someone to create something in tech i never had the big ambition to be a ceo of something like that was not the goal at all, right? So I wanted to participate in something that would generate value and something that would build from scratch, whatever role that was. Um, and uh, so and th this is this is what I what I perceived as you know the first step of, of attempting to do so. That's well, it. Strengthening competence, I think, in any field, uh, these skills, I think, they have these the yeah, spillover effect. Yeah, the, the, sk the skills are universal. Yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, not universal, universal. There is no playbook or something, but. You know, 80% is transferable and then 20% you can top it up whenever down the road, right? Uh, that being said, I mean, I'm, I'm always the, the huge fan of this concept that, that essentially you can learn whatever you want to learn in six months. And that also works. So if you, to, to tomorrow, you, you, know, you, you wake up and say, I do want whatever, an autonomous driving startup, or I want to build an AI company now, um, it will take you six months or so um, under pressure, of course, but uh, you will absorb as much knowledge as being able to at least coordinate or, you know, actions or at least understand, like, what, what is the direction you're going into uh, within the specific industry. Like, everything can be learned. You don't need four years in the university to do that, technically speaking. And the reason for that is pressure, because when you encounter something in the real world, it is absolutely not the same as when you encounter it on the, you know, behind the bench sitting, you know, in with a guy in front of you telling you how to do things, right? So um, that, that is all achievable. And then for me, it was breaking it down into pieces. 
and 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 you know trying to approach it sort of consequentially rather than you know just envisioning the big goal, understanding that I'm not there and uh, you know calling it a day. But in your opinion, um, do you believe that a person, for example, okay, let's change from yacht, like I mean. Yacht is also an example of whatever. that because yacht it, is, whatever drives is money. You, right? yeah. yeah, but do you believe that you can become successful if your goal is to become rich? Yeah. Or just isn't Absolutely. it that plain? Well, that depends on the you know on how how shallow or how deep your motivation is. But that is something totally different. Like if you are, it, it is look it, like it, it is a wild, wild, wild mixture of how the person actually like what propels the person forward and you know you have all sorts of variables in there you have the social background you have uh, the the society that you live in right so you have the peers the the environment you live in so your your friends family whatever anything right so so you know um, coming from certain background achieving financial security you know, in, in, in the way of being able to afford anything can be the, 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 the strongest motivational factor that you can ever imagine, right? And then at the, at the, on the other side of the spectrum, coming in from the background where maybe you were not that scarce, materially speaking, but then, you know, you always you always sort of thrived to, to explore the world out there and you were going to challenge things in the world out there is a totally different thing. And most probably these two people will build totally different businesses and you know, go totally different ways or maybe they will meet at some point, right? And these, and these motivational factors would actually collide into something you know, super workable, right? Where one would like to change the world and the other one who knows how to earn, how to earn money, right? And, and that is also, by the way, a very good combo to have on the team but but you know sort of getting back to this it depends right it depends yes earning shitload of money can be a very good motivating factor um depends on why why you need it like and and what do you do with it afterwards um because when people earn a lot of money um this is where a a fork happens um and and the fork looks as they try to put it to good use or they just sit with it right and and they they were essentially you know remain in the in the in the in the ecosystem you know in the in the surroundings um where where they started off and where they grew right and this is something that we see by the way with with the fund as well right so or with with any other um yeah pretty much with with the fund but also like when when observing even not with our own example, but when observing how how people, different backgrounds of people end up with, in, in biotech, for example. Like we have, you know, guys that have earned money elsewhere, um, you know, 40 years old, 50 years old, so very well accomplished individuals. Sitting down and saying, well, look, I mean, I've always been fascinating by, fascinated by, by biotech and I do understand that, you know, I cannot pretty much take any of it in, into, into the grade, right? Um, okay, I can pay for the future of my children, but then so what, right? I mean, there is no utility. I'm not creating any utility. I just, I'm just in possession of a resource. That's it. And, and, and then they say, you know, I, I, want to, I want to explore, right? And I, I want to sort of develop elsewhere. Now that I've earned it, I want to put it to use so that, you know, it actually produces some, some good to the society. Um, versus some people just buy a yacht or you know a 10th Lamborghini and that is also fine I mean whatever sort of floats your boat if, if you're happy with it you're free to do so. About the biotech world what uh, is interesting really you said you know the drug, drug trials really take, can take a decade and um, even more sometimes. Yeah yeah it depends on the drug but uh, the question is just regulatory wise uh, how uh, easy or, or you know, challenging is the process, especially from a, you know, a newbie perspective. Well, it's very challenging. I mean, imagine the minefield uh, through which you need to run for 10 years and you don't really know where the mines are planted. Um, what you have is a very approximate map of, of the field, um, which was drawn by you <laughs> <laughs> and, and which essentially represent your best assumption, yeah. right? 
um, and, 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 and sort of, you know, and then, and then on this map, you have some inputs from the people that ran through the field before. <laughs> and some of them died, some of them made it, right? But then it's sort of, it, it's, it's not, what, what it, where I'm leaning at is, if you look at the drug development process, where you start is, you start with the lab, right? So you start with um, a molecule target. And uh, once you have the molecule target validated, you say, okay, uh, this here would go into my in vitro studies. And in vitro studies is your first sort of round of essentially lab preclinics, no living orga organisms involved, so only cell cultures. Then if that yields some sort of results, you go into first in vivo studies in vivo in, in, hum in, in living organisms, not humans yet, living organisms. So this is your animal models can take you whatever two years. I am now assuming that the funding is there. Yeah. You're not, you not spending any, any time fundraising, right? Um, so that, that's sort of how Big Pharma would do it, right? So the funding is there, but then there is, you know, the R&D pipeline that is there in the, in the company. And then, um, and again, you're, I'm also assuming that you're working, you know your, your disease indication. So you know like which disease you're targeting, uh, and and what, what what is it that you have have to achieve in terms of you know pharmacological effect and pharmacokinetics of the whole thing and the, when it comes down to the body so you do your animals um, and this is where you start prepare to preparing to your i n d meeting i n d and i 'm talking u s now i n d meeting is investigatory new drug meaning and this is where you go to the fDA and say, well, this is the stuff i 've generated. Can you give me the approval to get into humans? Most probably your IND meeting would say, eh, yes, but then go and repeat this because we need more, more, more preclinical data on, on, this, on this part and that part and toxicology, whatever. For IND, your biggest task is essentially to prove the regulator that you will not poison the whole cohort of people, right? So toxic toxicity is your, your primary concern, right? So efficacy, some indications, yes, but then again, in animals, it's only as good as, 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 as it can be. Once you've got your R&D meeting, this is where you start recruiting for your phase, phase one clinical trial. Then you have phase two A clinical trial, phase two B clinical trial. Then you have phase three clinical trial, um, where phase one is safety. Um, and then starting from phase two, you are looking at efficacy as well. And this whole thing is sort of a never ending a never-ending sort of roller coaster of getting the patients and recruiting the patients, getting new study sites, clinical centers when you where you do the whole thing, and uh, you know managing patient dropout rates, managing patients that are well dying pretty much if we're talking about diseases that that actually you know develop fast such as cancers and, and what have you, and um, and then after phase three you compile a package, you go to the FDA. And luckily, if you're lucky enough, if the A says all your clinical data is good, um, you are now allowed to market the drug, right? And then after phase three comes phase four, which is post-market approval. And this is where you still are obliged, depends on the drug, obliged for, for a number of years to sure. essentially, well, observe yeah. whatever, whatever is happening. That being said, all the phase one, phase two, A, B, phase three, all of this is full of failures, sort of, and, and, and dead bodies in terms of you know clinical trials that actually fail. The whole stuff that is happening, I have a, I have an article on that by the way published, uh, and that is the whole stuff happening with Ukraine right now, as bad as it is uh, in terms of it being a war crime, had a an outrageously well disastrous impact on clinical trials because Ukraine and Belarus, by the way, were used as hubs by many, many pharmaceutical companies to test uh, because they were cheaper, of course, than you know, Western Europe and US um, to test oncology drugs, to test neurodegenerative drugs. And now we have a whole bunch of patients that will never ever survive to actually see these drugs to begin with. We have protocols disrupted. We have you know, essentially years, sometimes decades of clinical research all down the drain. And uh, it is sometimes very, I mean, it's salvageable in terms of, you know, initiating these studies once again, et cetera, et cetera, but you need to repeat things. 
because you're out of the protocol, you know, the protocol has collapsed, you're not observing these patients anymore. Is it even possible to do that for a small scale startup? Because I, what I have seen, at least the gist of it, is that big pharma companies, uh, of course, are really in, in, interested also in, in investing in these smaller ones. So. Uh, well, that, that depends. I mean, the whole, the whole timeline that I've described, right, is, is worth maybe, I mean, ballpark is maybe 5 billion, 6 billion US. Like the slab to, to the actual phase three, right? So around five to six billion. Um, for startups, look, um, if we're talking biotech, specifically therapeutic startups, so when you're developing a drug, you're not, really, you're not really going to sell it anyway. If you have IP, that is worth it. So if you manage to prove your case in preclinics, get through the IND and into phase one, most probably at a minimal, sort of case scenario, you will get big pharma venture arm as an investor already, right? So whatever, Merck Ventures or, you know, someone Roche Ventures will come over and would like to acquire a stake in, in your fundraising round. If you're super successful, you know, end of phase one, starting from phase two, it is not uncommon for, for the companies to actually list, do a NASDAQ, NASDAQ IPO, because we are talking if everything is well, we're talking valuations, you know, over over a billion dollars for sure for the company, right? Because the potential is huge. If you are in the area of oncology, if you are in the area of neurodegenerative diseases, if you are in the area of any sort of tissue regeneration or, you know, stem cell therapies or epigenetic reprogramming, whatever buzzwords I might throw at you, um, these are topics that, that pharmaceutical companies are chasing. And um, the way that big corporate, and this is not only for biotech, this is sort of their general rule of thumb, the way big corporate innovates is not through innovating internally, it's through acquiring innovation, right? So Apple is buying shitload of companies every year. Um, you know, Samsung's whatever of the world are doing the very same thing. Big software companies are doing the same thing because ultimately acquiring pieces of IP and you know, incorporating them into your portfolio is much, much, much cheaper than trying to you know assemble internal teams and then fuel your internal R and D and you know spend another year or two, whatever. Because but they have the engine, in a sense. You, they have, they have the cash. Okay, so they have the liquidity. When you have the liquidity, the world is a bit easier place to be, right? Um, so and this is when you're building the business as well. So you can do whatever amount of M and A's that you need and uh, strategic m and and less strategic m and and this is how you also grow in terms of your uniqueness. So, uh, by the way, you, you've asked about these, these core people, right? So Facebook or, or Google, maybe it's both actually, they were famous with these bench, benched engineers, right? Where, you know, you have very, very senior development engineers or coders that are not doing anything. They're not doing anything. They're not physically doing any work. They are still though, they're, they're keeping them on the full payroll, on the full bonus system, just so they don't leave to the competitor. So that you have guys that are so valuable that are, you know, earning whatever, uh, close to a million a year, just in the annual salary, not doing anything pretty much, right? And they're not asked to do anything. It's just so that they don't leave because the damage would be much more, much, like much, much bigger. Nice. That, that's like passive income without having, a, you know, a tangible asset in a sense. Yeah, of course. I mean, and, and Silicon Valley is full of these stories when, when people left one company and then, you know, miraculously, you know, the mother company found out that someone's flash drive has downloaded 50 gigs of, of something. And then two weeks later, mm -hmm. let's say an autonomous driving startup by your ex-employees pops up, right? And, and then it all looks miraculously familiar to whatever you were doing in your internal division on autonomous driving. And, uh, and th th it's full of it, yeah. right? And, uh, and sometimes you just keep, keep people there that way. Um, currently, you're part of the process of, uh, you know, an industry of creating uh, drugs and, I mean, and in this uh, specific field. So I, I'm interested. Um, it is in a process of creating something that would cure diseases for people with problems, basically. And... I want to know what in your mind is happiness in life and uh, right. have you find an answer <laughs> of the meaning of life? No, no, I haven't. The meaning of life is, I don't know. Um, freedom, maybe. To no, 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 that, that would be too cliche. Uh, <laughs> it's not freedom for sure. I mean, freedom is a very relative term. Like freedom for what, from what? 
Are you smoking? Like, are you a smoker? Uh, really rarely. Re okay, so you're relatively free, right, from, from one thing. So it's about dependence. It, it dep it's, about, it's about the factor you want, to, you want to attach it to. No, I think it's being able to be useful. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the purpose. Because coming back to the specialized society part of it, uh, so I'm one of these people that thinks that our society it has has absolutely steered in the direction where we like in the wrong direction. We're 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 not moving where we should be moving, and uh, I, I also do think that you know it has to do a lot with you know social media, with uh, with with the overall sort of vibe and, and, and values and what have you that people have. Um, and, and overall, you know, on average, very low self-esteem of people in the society anyway. That, but that's my, again, I mean, this is my, uh, my personal view. Uh, sure, of course. <laughs> uh, so, so, so realistically, I think it's, 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 being able, it's being able to deliver value and uh, in the way that is accessible to you. And in our case, it's, you know, it's, it's fueling the research. It's, uh, I, I do have my own personal bunch of motivation, of course, but not motivation in, in a personal way, but I, I have a very, very, very direct relationship with the area of rare diseases, for example, uh, in my own example, right? So in, in, in my own, right? So, um, and, and I know that, you know, so, so I, I know this from, from the inside as a patient, first and foremost. And uh, I, I think that, what society, society is pretty delusional. And society is pretty delusional in a way that when you're all young, and we are all, I mean, I'm 30, so I, I'm still considered young by most standards. Uh, we kind of don't care about the things that are yet to come. And what we don't realize is that these things will come much sooner than we expect. And, and we should be, you know, making our, our, our contributions and in, in, in trying to think collectively into how we, we, we sort of fix these things, right? And I'm, I'm, and I'm talking about, you know, fundamental problems for, for, for our society. I'm not talking, you know, economy or whatever, someone earning more money or less money or driving a better car or a worse car. That is all irrelevant, right? Uh, what's relevant is you have things uh, like, well, cancer is... You have things like neurodegenerative diseases. Um, you have things. You have so many things that can kill you before you're 30, if your genome is even minorly broken. And I assure you, you have no fucking clue if it's actually broken or not, right? I mean, you haven't you haven't looked at it. You haven't tested it. 99% of people haven't looked at it, right? So so we're not aware, essentially, of the of the hostile environment we're living in. Uh, and your parents are living in, and, and your families, and your relatives, and people you care about, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we become aware only when it's too late. So, eventually, you know, uh, people that are working in biotech, um, me including, and my partners including, um, we are, of course, we do have this monetary component which you asked about, right? Um, it can be because of the thesis of what you do. If you're an investor, you need to deliver returns. Like there is no other way of putting it, right? You're managing someone else's money. But then at the same time, you also look at it from the point of whenever you make these investments or whatever you are contributing to anything, um, you also try to project whether this will actually, will, you know, push, push the field like one millimeter forward, right? And, and uh, it, it maybe even that would not be applicable to you, but then sort of, you know, the generation to come will be able to use it. And so that, that's, the, that's the purpose, right? Um, and that can be then translated into pretty much any area, like pretty much any area. Would you be working in whatever, finance, um, art, anything, you know, you can always project whatever you're doing and actually try to understand whether you're generating any value. So, so try to think from that perspective rather than just, you know, my salary will be this much. Um, it, it does help. Like, it, it helps tremendously. Um, so, th but that's my take, right? That's my take. Um, so so it's, uh, it's the ability to generate value. That's the sort of the happiness or the usefulness, whatever you want to call it. 
two independent questions. Go. Um, <laughs> firstly, are you acquainted to, uh, with Naval Ravikant's philosophy? And secondly, no. uh, that's okay. Uh, just an interesting. <laughs> I don't uh, even know who that is. <laughs> that's great. That, then we have that's the second. Okay. That, that's why I have two questions. Right. And the second question is actually uh, okay. You know, people, of course, generally we are becoming more wealthy. Uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases are all also on the rise, the same with oncology. Uh, the question is, how do you even see the future of biotech, uh, yeah, biotech in general? Well, biotech is a, is, a, is a bit of a basket term, isn't it? I mean, uh, it is. it's, it's an umbrella thing. Uh, so if we talk about the longevity industry specifically, for example, for example, then the longevity industry would essentially care about maintaining your healthy human performance for as long as possible. And by healthy human performance, I'm not, I don't mean live to 150 years. Like I would not like to live to 150 years. I, I don't, I don't need that much. Right. I don't quality. want, I don't want that much either. Right. So, so it's all about, it's about quality of life always, uh, versus, versus the quantity really. I mean, ideally you would need to combine these two variables together. But when we talk about these diseases that you've mentioned, they are the ones that, you know, if, if they don't kill a patient, then they diminish the level of quality tremendously, right? Uh, and and so, so, so this is where the future, the future is, is trying to get at, right? And then you have another sort of philosophical debate, and that is maybe, just maybe, you know, you should not be, you should not be focused on, you know, treating cancer. You should be focused on preventing cancer, which is a totally different ball game, right? So your your major focus and your major investment should be into preventative medicine, into early early super early screening, rather than trying to come up with you know methods that would magically cure a person, you know, third fourth stage, uh, which is practically impossible. So, you know, there there are a lot of things unanswered. And then, I mean, since you're mentioning whatever, neurodegenerative, we don't even know why this is happening. Yeah. Like, we don't know. Yeah, there is, well, there we is, have a lot of, I would say, clues. Well, these are hypotheses, right? So, so the, the Alzheimer's, the biggest Alzheimer's hypothesis, for example, um, is, well, the observation, it's called the amyloid hypothesis, right? So it's an observation that the brain of the Alzheimer's patients has an accumulation of so-called amyloid plaque, right? Yes. Um, which are, you know, these amyloid enzymes that are, you know, colliding together. With, uh, on the sheath of the myelin. Technically speaking. Well, I mean, sheath of the myelin is a bit of a different thing, but, but sort of what you have is like, you know, the huge, when you look at the MRI of the Alzheimer's patients in, in the certain stages, it's all white, right? Um, and then that's the hypothesis. Like we have the amyloid plaque in the brain, Let's get rid of the amyloid plaque. It will stop the disease or do whatever. Bunch of clinical trials, billions of dollars invested. We got rid of the amyloid plaque. Cognitive decline still happens. Well, you st start digging further. Well, maybe it was the toxicity of the amyloid plaque that, that was the one to, to cause the whole thing. I'm talking decades of research now. Like this is very condensed, right? But these are like 10 years since people are, you know, making these, you know, new sort of iterations. Maybe it's the toxicity. Well, how the fuck do you check, right? I mean, well, we need to prevent the amyloid plaque then. Bunch of research, billions of dollars, um, amyloid vaccines now in, in, in clinical trials. It's still a hypothesis, like it's still a hypothesis. Um, maybe, you know, it has to do, for example, like the, the very recent bunch of papers in Nature published that, for example, patients with um, MS, with multiple sclerosis, which is another non-curable, essentially neurodegenerative disease, very, very prone to, into young, into young adults, by the way, like 30 years old or so, or so um, that most of the patients essentially have the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, which they don't feel in their blood, right? But that eventually causes the immune reaction, the autoimmune reaction, that causes the antibodies to develop. And these are the ones that are attacking myelin, right? And, and myelin sheath on the, uh, on the neurons. So again, but it's a hypothesis, right? So you never, you never ever actually know. 
even the lab models that we have right now, and that is, for example, testing all these, you know, amyloid, fancy amyloid things on mice, uh, these are genetically engineered mice. These are mice that are born with Alzheimer's, right? So these are so-called Alzheimer's models on which you test these on. And these are not resembling humans. I mean, very, very far away, yes. So very basic sort of kinetics of the whole thing, yes, you can observe. But, you know, the complexity it's not, is really yeah, I mean, you have only one drug uh, in, in from, you know, in, in neurodegenerative and Alzheimer's specifically that was approved by the FDA, which is aducanumab that was developed by Biogen. And uh, they have and it was a very controversial decision but because of because FDA would not be able to allow anything like this in the other area, disease area. Uh, with the inconclusive clinical data that Adukanumab actually had. Now FDA is trying to understand whether they can pull it out of the market because I mean it's like you know the criticism is so big that and, and, and it has to do with amyloids specifically right so so like the, the Biogen never actually proved that the whole thing worked it was just a big assumption so what I'm leaning at is you know when you exit this building today you have you see things that are familiar, right? And you kind of feel safe, right? Yeah. And you kind of feel in control. Eventually, you don't have a single clue whatever happens with, you know, a certain SNP pair in your genome, if you have it, um, that represents your risk to develop whatever. And if you develop whatever, whole new life starts. Like not in, not in the best understanding of, of the, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not being too, too negative here. It's, it's very realistic. So, so, you know, what we start with, what we need to collectively start thinking about is, is this. So how do we, you know, how do we start thinking about solving these, these issues little by little? On a collaborative and a large scale. On a collaborative basis, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, a solo effort doesn't cut it anyway. It never cuts it, right? Solo effort is a very egoistic, egoistic one, you know, to begin with. So... Yeah, and that's that's what VC funds, and this is what we are doing, and we we hope to you know uh, deliver our part. But then again, you never know. Yeah. Uh, it's all like a you know a big gamble, pretty much. Um, as we're closing, uh, coming closer to the end, um, right. um, maybe there's something you would uh, tell to our listeners or ask us. Um, if not, then we can conclude. But if you come up with something. Like a catchphrase, maybe. Yeah. A catchphrase. A motto. <laughs> uh, who is the listener first and foremost? Like, give me a, a portrait. Like, a, you know, uh, you I would were... say uh, an RGSL student, firstly, and or maybe an RGSL professor, maybe Our potential a colleague student. of yours, right? <sighs> colleague of mine. Well, maybe well, colleagues of mine are you know all this stuff anyway. <laughs> uh, RGSL professor is might be very well anchored in their own life beliefs uh, so i will not change anything students though <laughs> this is this is good material to work with no i mean look honestly um i think you know when i was a student back in the days okay um i wish that someone would actually tell me a uh, few things one is um you should never, ever, ever, like the stupidest, the stupidest life choice you can make, the, the most retarded one, like top one, is comparing yourself to others. Indeed. Never do it. Like, like you know, even if, if, if it helps delete Instagram, right? <laughs> right? If, you, if, you, if you want Check. to. No, seriously. Check. Like, it makes, it, makes you, it makes you a, you know, a disabled, a socially disabled person, and it makes you live someone else's life which you don't want to do, you want to live yours, right? So whenever you want to compare yourself, yourself to, to something, compare with yourself, but whatever, a year ago, right? And if you're worse off now, well, that's your problem, right? <laughs> whatever you made wrong. Um, and then the second one is, uh, so because of the amount of work that I had, I never, ever, ever actually, so I very often failed to enjoy things that I had. Like, I, I, I literally failed, uh, and, and I understand it now, but these things are gone now, like long gone. 
So, you know, try to, even if you are whatever mission, vision driven, whatever big picture you, 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 you drew right for yourself, um, you know, never fail to whatever, enjoy life. Uh, you, you should you should be able to enjoy life absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise, the whole thing doesn't make sense either, right? So I mean, you can you can deliver as much value or as much utility you you, you want to deliver, but then you know if you were miserable in the process, then, then <laughs> what's the point, right? So keep 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 time for your for yourself. Uh, that will that will be something that I would you know I I would wish someone actually taught me back in the days. Uh, but well, you know it comes all comes as hard experience. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I Thank think you. this was a quite uh, energetic and uh, inspiring. Ho hopefully, I mean, <laughs> hopefully, I was not very, uh, you know, I was not very uh, eager to to tell that whatever we might wanna or we might just die no, tomorrow because no. of whatever. <laughs> I think uh, I also gained a lot of insight. I hope the listeners as well. And uh, yeah, yeah, looking at all the cameras. Course, yeah, and I hope you the enjoyed. Crowd. I hope you enjoyed the new environment yeah. and see you next time. Thank you.